Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affairs Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik, and this is your part number three. And in this video, we are going to discuss question number forty-one to question number sixty. So let us get started. And in case you have still not checked out the test series of uh, PMF IS, it's available at a very special price of four ninety-nine. The link is in, given in the description uh, below. So please check out the very high quality mcqs available at a very affordable price i'm sure it is going to boost your score, scores of the upcoming prelims so we start with the question number 41 and uh, the question 41 was with respect to the all india judicial services very important question and uh, uh, this is something which is uh, which is in the news very much these days because the government is planning to have a all india judicial services very similar uh, on very similar lines that we have the all india administrative services so let's first understand about this and then we'll come back to the main question so talking about all india judicial services this is as per article 312 you have to go back and as per the article 312 of the constitution whenever if you have to establish an all india judicial services or any other all india services so ultimately for that particular purpose the power lies with the rajya sabha and exclusively with the rajya sabha that also i need to mention if ever you have to create all india services it is only and only after the recommendation of the rajya sabha and if rajya sabha declare through a resolution of at least two third majority and uh, then it gives power to the parliament to come with a law where an all india service can be created now why rajya sabha because rajya sabha is considered to be the representative of the states the states interests are actually covered under the rajya sabha and that's why the special power has been given to the rajya sabha So now, if you want to create all India judicial services, you have to do it utilizing Article three one two, right? Okay. Now, very interestingly, when I'm saying all India judicial services, there is a very interesting parameter. If that all India judicial services are going to get created, then it cannot include any post inferior to that of a district judge. Means minimum. the recruitment under all india judicial services the minimum recruitment should be district judge or above you can't recruit any post which is inferior to the district judge that is a benchmark which is being set and the district judge can include any city civil court judge it may be additional district judge can be joint district judge assistant district judge chief judge of sufri of a small uh, cause court um it can be anybody but minimum parameter is this district judge parameter now if you look at the question you will see all the three statements that are given to you are absolutely correct so there are these are the important things that you need to remember for the all india judicial services article 312 check and uh, rajya sabha powers check and then we have that the that uh, as per the constitution 312 article the post can't be inferior to the district judge so yes all the three statements are absolutely correct so here the answer has to be d now <clears throat> very importantly how to proceed this kind of question maybe you are not maybe you are not aware with the articles and the upsc may trick you with the articles so because that's a fact with the articles you really have to be little bit careful because uh, there you cannot do any guess work but at least at least you can understand the whole phenomena of the all india judicial services and at least you know that there are certain special power of the rajya sabha all india services is being one of them so understanding that you can still uh, uh, solve this questions it was a medium level but you can still attempt it you may have to take a little bit of risk with the articles because articles can be manipulated by the examiner but most of the cases answer is going to be the correct one right so that that's the way you can proceed question number 42 was a very straight forward question and the question says you have to figure out this type of drug allergy the keyword was a drug allergy that can occur as a reaction to large variety of medications patients usually pres uh, you know present with the rashes and fevers and uh, eosinophilia 
Sometimes this kind of drug allergy is referred as DHIS, which is called drug induced hypersensitivity syndrome. So we are talking about what? So definitely it cannot be Kessler syndrome. Kessler syndrome is altogether different phenomena that relates to the space debris we already have covered in our test. And it is not Down syndrome, it is not Red syndrome. The right answer is Dress syndrome. Of course, for those who are who are not aware of this, any of them, the question was a tough one. And you have no other option but to skip because you, ca you don't really have a scope to, uh, you know, you, you can't have, have a scope to do the guesswork here. Very factual, straightforward question. So what is a dress syndrome? You need to learn here first. So dress syndrome, full form is important. The full form has everything. The full form says dress means drug rash with uh, eosinophilia and systematic symptoms. This is actually a severe allergic reaction that happens to people uh, when they consume certain kind of medicines or drugs. So basically what happens in the dress syndrome, why this allergy happens? Because there is some issue that happens with the T cell. T cell is one of our immunity cells. Uh, T cell is one of the type of the, uh, of the white blood corpuscles. We have a WBC, no? WBC responsible for the immune system. So T cell is one of that WBC and that actually shows hypersensitivity and um, this damage under the, cyst, the dress syndrome occurs due to overreaction from the immune system. So whenever you take any medicine, your immune system sometimes overreact. Because of that, you have the issue of the dress syndrome. And when it comes to mortality, up to 10%, it can be fatal also. It can lead to the death. 10% death chances are there. Normally, after 2 to 8 weeks of the, of the drug, the medicine that you take, the symptoms come into the play. And the major symptoms include the skin rashes, fever. Then, then it may lead to uh, uh, the hematologic abnormalities, swollen lymph nodes, and maybe it can impact the internal organs. So very important concept, very much in the news. Do expect question coming onto that. Another question is again a very straightforward question. And it is asking you to talk about NOMA. So NOMA, what, what is NOMA which is in news sometimes? Is it a newly drug, discovered drug? No, it is not. Is it a nano compound? Maybe for some people may do this guesswork, but again, no. It is not even a new variant of COVID coronavirus. It is actually a neglected tropical disease recently, which is being included in the list by WHO. So right answer here has to be D again. This question was a tough one. Why I'm calling it tough? It's a straightforward question. If you have read it, it becomes really easy for you. But it becomes tough for those who really have no idea about that. So in that particular case, better to skip rather than taking any risk. Because that would be purely blind work. So why NOMA is in news? Please understand. So NOMA, actually the word NOMA uh, came from the Greek word NOME. NOME means to devour. Basically NOMA is a kind of disease that actually eats away your facial tissues and facial bones. If you do not treat it norm, uh, at the early stage, it becomes devastating for your face. So recently this NOMA, it was added by uh, WHO in the list of neglected tropical diseases. You understand? And this NOMA has other names also. It is also known as the cankerum oris, also called as the gangrenous, gangrenous uh, stoma, uh, stomatitis is, is another name for it. And this is a serious disease that can de uh, deform your face, your mouth, and that too with a very high mortality rate. Look at this mortality rate of insane, 90% mortality rate. Death rate is so high in the case of NOMA. And now to spread awareness about it, now to make it more mainstream disease, that's why WHO has added NOMA into the list of neglected tropical disease. This disease is not contagious, so be careful about it. Don't think that it is going to, uh, uh, you know, pass on from one person to another. It is non-contagious. And, uh, and in most of the cases, in which kind of population, or are, are what, what are the major associations of this uh, disease? It is mainly prominently, uh, you know, it appears in those areas that are suffering from extreme poverty or some areas with malnutrition or poor access to sanitation and oral hygiene. So these are, I'm not saying always, but you can say these are some of the preconditions, associations 
that noma is associated with so it's a very new and important concept guys and i really want you to learn and remember these points because these are the kind of questions that upsc would be targeting this year next question is pretty simple i, I mean this is very simple concept we have heard it a number of times the question is about the correct description of the article 35a which is very much in the news we know when the government scrapped article 370 along with 370 the 35a was also abrogated what 35a was all about so we know one thing for sure it relates to jammu and kashmir okay but what exactly was 35a was was it about defining administrative powers to the jammu kashmir government no was it about uh, uh, you know article securing special rights to permanent residents yes so you know under like the 370 gave special status to jammu kashmir 35a which was in association with 370 actually gave the the residents the original residents of jammu kashmir they this uh, 35a recognized them as permanent residents and that gave them very some very special rights like for example nobody could buy the land other than the permanent residents of jammu kashmir no no outsider was allowed to come and buy land in jammu kashmir so permanent residents so 35 actually talks about those permanent residents the original residents of jammu kashmir and giving them some special rights so answer has to be b very simple question easy and straight away can be answered right so what this 35a if you have you have the explanation in front of you and uh, uh, defining clearly def defined the permanent residents and provided them rights and privileges and uh, now since 370 has been scrapped even 35a is also out of order now it is it also does not exist anymore please remember that next question we have is with respect to the tuberculosis tb very common question very common topic you think of tb you think of india why india is becoming the tb capital of the world we know the basics about tb right tb is a bacterial infection yes caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis absolutely correct india has the highest burden of tb in the world yes it in, indeed that's why i'm saying think of india think of tb because in india there are more than 25 percent cases of tb alone in india and india is becoming the tb capital of the world that is not very good sign for the developing country like india so yes but unfortunate but it is true so what are we doing what government is doing about it so government has started this pradhan mantri tb mukt bharat abhiyan very good wonderful but what it what is its target year now this time the question has a problem with respect to the target year please remember 2030 is the year target year to eliminate tuberculosis but not for india that is the global target and india because india has a huge burden india do not want to go slow on eliminating tb so we are aggressively trying to eliminate the tb and that's why in india the target is five years ahead of the global target and our target is 2025 where we are targeting to eliminate tb under pradhan mantri tb mukt bharat abhiyan so that's why the second one is wrong so answer is c one and three right answer very easy easily you can attempt it because this is a very common topic i'm sure we all have read it at some point or the other so any special uh, information that you need to add on very interesting let me tell you you must have heard about leprosy also no leprosy is also caused by mycobacterium leprae right and uh, this mycobacterium leprae and the tb causing bacteria mycobacterium tuberculosis both belongs to the same family this is one interesting fact that you need to know you never know what when you can use this information and tb uh, you know tb has a big problem why it, it it is so much in india because tb is really you know transferable kind of disease it spreads from one person to another and that's why uh, it spreads so fast in, in in countries like in developing countries like india especially with huge population especially those areas where you do not find a uh, good level of sanitation and hygiene in that particular areas you have these kind of problems and when it comes to symptoms you can remember like chronic cough with blood in mucus that is first sign that you have you may have a tb is the blood in your mucus that comes out uh, thankfully the tb is treatable and it is curable and that's why the government is aggressively targeting it 
and uh, government is making sure to eliminate it by 2025 this is actually important and and what's the credi credibility of highest burden of tb on india the who global tb report only said and very latest 2023 report only said india has 27 percent burden of the tuberculosis cases right that takes us to the question number 46 question is about with respect to tribunals for the first time in our test series we are going to talk about tribunals and that is very important topic please put a star mark can be important for the UPSC prelims exam so what you need to know about the tribunals first let's try to understand what are tribunals what how they were formed there's a long history of tribunals in India interestingly you must know what are them and from where they have come so right now I'm sure you must have heard the word tribunal. What is a tribunal, by the way? First, understand this. Tribunal is basically a quasi-judicial body which was established under the Act of the Parliament and it can, be, it can be established under Act of State Legislature also. But that depends on for what purpose we are creating tribunal. We'll come on to that. But as of now, please understand, tribunals are kind of alternative to the, you know, uh, to the main judiciary infrastructure that we have rather than going to the courts you have for certain purposes you also establish certain tribunals like the best example you can think of is the national green tribunal the ngt so and uh, the ngt it actually works like a civil court you don't really have uh, uh, you don't really have tribunals for the criminal activities for criminal activities you you have to go to the courts only so tribunals were actually set up as a as an alternative civil courts Considering the already pending and uh, like pending cases and burden or overburdened judiciary so as to give them a little bit of relief and as a part of alternative dispute resolution the tribunals were set up. When they were set up guys interestingly tribunals for the first time were set up in India by 42nd amendment act the very controversial act which we also call as mini constitution that was uh, passed during the emergency 1976 by then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and from that point onwards and by this 42nd Amendment Act we incorporated two clauses two articles in our Constitution article 323 a article 323 B both relates to tribunals but what is the difference between the two let me tell you this very interestingly this article 323 a a means what it talks about the administrative tribunals this is the best way to remember a is administrative tribunal a for this and a for this when it comes to administrative tribunals that can be created only by the parliament and state legislature has nothing to do in that but when it comes to article 323 b tribunals for other matter other than administrative purpose other tribunals can be created and that can be done by both parliament as well as state legislature now easy way to remember you, you think of B, B is the second letter, no? So think of two. Two means parliament and state legislature. A means administrative, only one that is parliament. So that way you can remember. So this is the history of uh, tribunals that we have in, in, in our India. Very interestingly and something that you must remember, guys. Mostly the tribunals, they do not follow the technicalities of the rules and the procedures or the evidences that we have in the normal civil court procedure or the evidence act so if, if if there is any statement that says that the tribunals are restricted by the procedures of civil code or evidences act you can say no they are not bound by these so what exactly drives the tribunals or what actually controls the tribunals is that they follow the principles of natural justice and that makes the working of tribunals quite wider quite comprehensive in their jurisdiction I hope you got this point right so now if you come back if you come back to the question you can easily say there is problem with the first statement guys why problem it was not the 44th but 42nd act in 1976 uh, that incorporated tribunals in our constitution so yeah first is wrong second is correct because it, it says the administrative tribunal so you I hope you remember the article 323 a I'm talking about that is only by parliament and for other matter that is 323b and that that can be done by both state and uh, parliament so answer has to be b uh, i would say the question was very easy one there is no problem nothing about that so could have been attempted very easily right
just be careful about and and i i am i tell you many many times guys do prepare and do read about 42nd amendment act there is a reason why we call it as mini constitution and there is absolutely no reason you don't read it before you go to the exam my one more suggestion whenever you read about 42 always read 42nd amendment in association with 44th because majority of the provisions of 42 they were turned down or changed in 44th amendment so please do read them both and that too uh, you know in relation to each other that that gives you more idea about these things next question 47 was with respect to the grants there are different different grants that we have in our uh, parliamentary system so we have supplementary grants additional grants excess grant exceptional grants normally what happens you know whenever the budget is being presented so every ministry for every policy there is certain uh, amount of expenditure that we expect and for any particular scheme a certain amount is given as as all uh, as the as the budget that is being allo uh, allotted for this particular scheme now let's imagine let's imagine when the expenditure exceeds the parliamentary authorized amount parliament say okay for this scheme you are going to get 100 crore rupees and let's say now the expenditure has gone up and now it expenditure has gone up by 25 25 crore rupees more so basically in that particular case when the expenditure exceeds the parliamentary authorized limit for that purpose you always try to raise for a supplementary grant please remember this very interestingly supplementary grant is only for that purpose where you already have got some amount you have mostly spent it and now you are in middle of the process of the implementation of the policy means your policy is already being rolled out and now you need extra money to carry forward then you have supplementary grant makes sense very very that actually what what is the meaning of supplementary supplementary is uh, other than the main grant now you i'm supplementing your resources right additional grant look at this additional grant and you can clearly see the right answer lies here not here the word additional grant is is raised if additional expenditure is needed upon the uncontemplated new service that particular budget year if if um, you have first asked for let's say 50 crore rupees and now you have understood oh i have not accounted for certain things now i need more money there is actually some recalculation that you have done and you need additional money that is the additional grant that you have then there is there is another point called as excess grant now this relates to the option so th this clearly is wrong here even third one is wrong what is an excess grant excess grant is granted when money is already spent on any service you have already spent it now you want to recover now you want to get back as a as a uh, what you say as you have already spent from your resources and now you are going to get from the uh, uh, from the parliament what is the difference between uh, the other two and this here you are asking money before spending in both the cases supplementary or the additional you have not spent that extra money there is there is a demand for that and so that's why you are asking for money before spending so you are you want that money you will get that money then only you will spend in excess grant the the department the ministry has already spent more already spent more and now you are just trying to get it back from the from the uh, parliament as a part of recovery you have spent it from your own other resources now you are uh, justifying that see i have already spent more so i need that money so that is the difference in in the first supplementary and additional one you have not spent in real there is a demand the the prices are going up the expenditure is going up but before spending you are asking the money that is the basic difference and then you have exceptional grant exceptional grant is really exceptional as it says exceptional it is like rare or some something which is not common it's a grant for particular purpose and it forms no part of the current service of any financial year it is something which comes by surprise you are not prepared for the for that year. there is some kind of uh, uh, policy or some kind of purpose which was not accounted or which was not planned for that year and something happened suddenly for that purpose there is a provision for the exceptional grant for some unforeseen circumstances make sense so here the right answer is only two and you can clearly see the problem with second and third they are being inter exchange 
question was a medium level question but i i can't say it cannot be attempted it could have been attempted if you literally understand the meanings and you can apply some kind of logic into that okay chalo that takes us to the uh question number 48 now this question is again important and something that was in news very much for the last few months is it talks about the places of the worship act 1991 and the question is completely about this particular act so we need to discuss it first and then we'll come back to the question why this is so important act why this why this so called uh, uh, this places of worship act 1991 you know you understand clearly why it was created at the first place 1991 india saw one of the worst communal rights after the babri masjid was demolished and you know the history uh, about it right so now after that kind of disorder after that kind of chaos over the uh, over the places of worship this particular act was passed so why this act was passed for the first place now you know the history this the the places of worship act was passed with objectives to provide the maintenance of the religious character of any place of the worship and again the purpose was to curb communal tension we do not we never wanted anything like babri to happen again in our country and that is why there was there were the, there were uh, uh, this act which was trying to prohibit conversion of any place of worship and and, and it clearly said it says you know there is absolutely clear guidelines as per this act section 3 of this act which clearly says there should be absolutely no conversion of a place of worship if it was a muslim worship place it has to be like that if it is a hindu worship place it has to be like that so very clear guidelines were given after the devastation of babri masjid that is the background of this particular act clearly i hope you got this point now now very importantly when you're talking about this uh to maintain the place of worship now it it actually took the underline as the independence of india section 4 of this act clearly says to maintain the religious character of a place of worship as it was on 15th august 1947 so any place after 47 need not to be converted and that is not going to be allowed to to get converted so benchmark was nine, not 91 benchmark was 47 that is the kind of vision this particular act had but again there were some exceptions the section 5 of this act had some exceptions where the act is not going to be implemented upon like for example this act do not apply to number 1 any ancient or historical monument or archaeological site that is being covered by the amasr which is ancient monument archaeological site act so if if there is any act which is covered under this then this act is not going to apply on that number 1 second condition it is not going to be applicable for those uh, places or sites that has already been settled or resolved and the dispute has been resolved by the mutual agreement by the communities so something that has that dispute is already so settled it is not going to uh, reverse any anything of that sort or if third point very special exception ram janam bhoomi babri masjid ayodhya the one recently set in by supreme court if there is any particular site which is all which is associated with some legal proceed because the time it was passed 1981 there was already the case in the supreme court so that's why if there is any particular uh, any particular site which is which is controversial but the case is already pending even on that this act is not supposed to be applicable and we have seen where the supreme court utilized article uh, special powers under article 142 to deliver the complete justice and supreme court has clearly gave the verdict in the ram janam bhoomi and where there was babri masjid now we have got this ram mandir right so these were some exceptions that were put out in the in this particular act now since this particular matter is very fresh and we have seen that uh, uh, on january 22nd the the ram mandir was inaugurated so probable there are every possible chance of you getting this question in your exam here the first statement is correct but there is problem with second and third because look at this deadline it is not the deadline was not 1991 we have seen the the status is to be maintained as of 15th august 1947 so clearly this is wrong and again it says of course 
if there is any act which is under another, another act called AMASR act, then of course this new act is not going to be applicable. So answer here is only going to be one. I would say this question was a medium one, but you could have attempted because this is something which was in the news for the last one years. And there are n number of articles, n number of news that, that in, in which this kind of news were covered. Next question was a, another uh, very hot topics, one of the favorite topic of UPSC and also one of the favorite topics of Indian politics where every state is, is uh, demanding special category status. Uh, the, the front runner of this special category status demand is Bihar and uh, many times Bihar has passed resolution demanding and asking for the special category status. So let's try to understand what this special category status is and why it is so much demanded by the, uh, by the states and from where it, this whole concept comes. Let me tell you that when it comes to uh, so-called special category status which is called SCS, so this is basically a classification given by the center and why certain states were considered as special category status because those states were having some socio-economic disadvantages or those states were having some kind of geographical disadvantages. That's why the center had classified them as the special category states so that the center could have assisted those states in the development process. If there is, a, there, there is some state which is already in some disadvantaged position, it is, it is the duty of center to assist in the development process. And for that purpose only this special category status category was created. But please remember in our constitution there is absolutely no provision for this kind of thing. It is purely done by the center just to make it easy to assist the states nowhere it is constitutional procedure. Also why so many states like Bihar and Andhra and so many states why they keep demanding special category status because if any, any state get this uh, special category status, in that case, the center is going to give 90% of the funds required in all centrally sponsored schemes. So right now you know, whenever there is a central sponsored scheme, the funding is shared between state and the center, right? And in very normal scenarios, the center mostly pays 60% and the state is to pay rest of the 40% of the, of the fund. But if you are a special category state, only 10% you have to contribute, 90% funds to be given by center. Now you know the politics and you know the economics, right? That this is the reason why every state wants to get a status of special category status because then the state spending becomes really low and you become more dependent on the state funding. That is, that is there. And in fact, in fact, there is a mandatory clause that 30% of the state's gross budget should, should go to the special category states and that's why all the states and many many states they keep demanding and Bihar is the front runner in the demand of the special category status. Now as of now in India there are 11 states that have got this status. How to remember? Very easy. So remember it like this all the northeastern states including Sikkim. So seven uh, the seven sisters of northeast and their brother Sikkim along with the three states that we have as Himachal, uh, Uttarakhand, right? And then we have, uh, okay, it, it, it has not, there was Jammu Kashmir also, even Jammu Kashmir had this special category status. But right now we have special category status for, now you can, you can uh, uh, it is not 11 anymore. Of course, there has to be Jammu Kashmir, but now it has become uh, uh, UT, right? So that's why you can now uh, give the number as 10. So um, yeah, so there are seven northeastern states, one Sikkim and then remaining you have, okay and even Telangana is, is there, yes sir, so it is 11 anymore, fine, sorry, so make it 11 only. There used to be Jammu Kashmir also but now Jammu Kashmir is no more uh, a state, it is, it is a bifurcated UT. So now Telangana is into the list, so how to remember, very simple, so seven northeastern states, one Sikkim. Then you have two Himalayan states as Himachal and Uttarakhand and then you have the Telangana. So that way you can remember these are the 11 states that in India we have got a special category status. Now you please, uh, for many people Telangana was not there earlier. So be careful, Telangana, Telangana is now 
into the category of special category status okay that brings us to the question number 50 the question is about dodo have you heard of dodo dodo is a, it's a bird which is now extinct it is no more available it is no more present no more surviving anywhere dodo's uh, uh, status as of now is completely extinct so first you need to know about dodo and then we have to come back to the question so if you look at the at some of the information about dodo this dodo it was a flightless bird very similar to penguins penguins are also flightless birds so even dodo was a flightless bird but that was endemic originally belonging to this to the islands of mauritius very important point to remember you can see the pics are available of the dodo now this the, the dodo was a herbivorous uh, species and uh, uh, was mainly found used to found in the dry lowland forests but unfortunately right now its iucn status is extinct why because the major cause of its extinction was the hunting that was done by the dutch colonist we know that in mauritius there were dutch colonies right so they have hunted it down and along with the dutch colonist as a hunter there were other invasive species as dog cat rats and since they were flightless birds they were not in a position to fly and and save them um, you know so mostly they were hunted by all these ground predators so right now they are extinct unfortunate but true so now if you look at the question they have made a little bit of uh, uh, manipulation so dodo is a flightless bird yes but that was not belonging to maldives that used to belong to mauritius so you know the right answer as mauritius here so yeah this was not correct the second one is correct what about the guesswork can you do the guesswork no i do not think you can do a guesswork here if you are not aware because this is purely fact so my suggestion though it was a medium level question if you do not know the information please do not take a risk better to skip because you how would you guess if it is maldives or seychelles or mauritius or some other island no so that becomes tough sometimes a simple question becomes tough due to lack of information and you really do not have any way uh, to you know to solve that brings us to question number 51 question 51 is about the surrogacy in india very important because after 2021 we have india has got a new law on the surrogacy and uh, the surrogacy law 2021 and also the art are artificial uh, reproductive assistance uh, assisted reproductive technology the art bill of 2021 both the laws are very very important uh, when you when you uh, have to talk about the alternative ways of you know delivering the baby so surrogacy is one such topic which which was in news which is in news which will be in news even in future so you must know that in india uh, there was we we were having problem what is a surrogacy by the way first you need to know the meaning of a surrogacy so surrogacy is like let's say there is a couple and uh, this couple is uh, uh, is medically proven uh, and it's been 5 years of their marriage and and it's medically proven that these this couple cannot conceive their their child so normally what can be done so uh, another there was a surrogate there used to be a surrogate mother so they used to hire some third person third lady as a surrogate mother and that third lady used to uh, you know bear the child and she she is going to bear all the pregnancy and used to deliver the kid for this particular couple now this surrogacy can be of two types it can be altruistic can be commercial in india before 2021 commercial surrogacy was very much prominent and that too in gujarat in fact gujarat was considered to be the hub where lot of even not just indians lot of foreigners used to come to gujarat especially the ananda district and there they used to uh, hire the surrogate mother used to give them money and just for the sake of money those ladies the, those local ladies they used to bear the child and uh, in exchange of some money some lakhs of rupees what were, were exchanged this was a commercial surrogacy now of course in 2021 the government banned this commercial surrogacy and now it is being clear that in india there is absolutely absolute ban on commercial surrogacy you cannot become mother just for the sake of money exchange and the couples can't simply go and 
you know, in exchange of money can't do that. You know, we know what the commercial surrogacy is, right? Now in India, only altruistic surrogacy is allowed. Altruistic surrogacy is not for the money. The word altruistic is for some good reason, for good, for some good purpose. Now altruistic surrogacy is when, when somebody, somebody from your family only volunteers to carry your child if that person is really near uh, your relative and, in, and that to be the condition. So whosoever volunteers for altruistic uh, surrogacy, that lady must be having at least one of their child, their own child before uh, she gets into the altruistic surrogacy. Of course, the couple uh, is going to pay for all that procedure and all, but not supposed to give money to that particular person because altruistic is done on a voluntary basis, not for the commercial, not for the money. So even going, going by the definition, I have told you enough history now, you see the both statements are incorrect because it is a very simple question. Just look at the meanings. Altruistic does not involve the profit purpose and commercial is of course always for the financial compensation. So both statements are wrong. Both are inter exchange basically. It is the altruistic which is not done for the financial purpose. Commercial always has this profit angle. So here both statements uh, which are correct. No, both are incorrect. Answer has to be D. Even if you are not aware about all the knowledge that I gave you, at least you are aware about, you can easily make sure the you can rule out the two by going by simple English definition of the meanings, right? So sometimes you really don't have to be good with the facts and good with the knowledge, but sometimes even, even with a simple understanding of the statements, you can uh, easily do that, right? So now I have told you all the reasons here, you, you have all the information. And as per this surrogacy, surrogacy regulation bill that I told you uh, that was passed in 2021, there are some interesting uh, features. There are certain conditions. Now, who can go for surrogacy? That is also being mentioned in the in the act very clearly. It's not like anybody can go and uh, 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 get the surrogacy done. No, there are very clear instructions that surrogacy services are to are available for which kind of couple. So as per the act, the intended couple, that particular couple has to be Indian, has to be infertile and that to be married couple. Please understand three keywords. Now no foreigner is allowed for surrogacy in India and there has to be a medical proven fact and there has the couple has to be married couple. Now for example, if somebody is staying in living, living peoples are not allowed. Even uh, the surrogacy is not allowed for the same sex couples. It has to be heterogeneous couple as a married couple, then only the surrogacy things can be done and that th that also should have an age issue. The women in that uh, 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 in that couple should be between 23 to 50 years of age and the man should be between 25 to 55 years of the age. Then the couple must not be having any living children, must not have any living children uh, of their own. It, it, it can't be done like you already have one child and now for the second child you want to go to, for the surrogacy, that is not allowed. But there are one exception, like for example, if you have your own living child, but that child is mentally disabled or having some other compli complex issues or that child is suffering from the risk of death, then in that case you can go for the surrogacy. But if you are a healthy child already, then surrogacy is not to be allowed for you. Okay. And yes, very interestingly, who can be the surrogate mother? So any willing mother who wants to be a surrogate should be between age of 25 to 35 and she must be having at least one of her ch children uh, uh, before becoming surrogate mother. So these are very clear cut instructions that are being put here. And absolutely the surrogate prohibited from providing her own gametes for, sur uh, for the surrogacy. The surrogate must not receive any compensation for carrying the child. The only thing is the couple has to pay for all the necessary insurance and the medical cost. That's it. So very interesting and I would suggest along with this uh, surrogacy regulation bill, do read about the ART bill also, the ART bill of 2021, do read about that also. The both needs to be uh, read simultaneously, both are important guys. Brings us to the question number 52. So now we have got very favorite part of the UPSC, the match the following. So on one side there were biodiversity heritage sites and you have to match them with the states. Absolutely clueless part. Now, I personally think this, these kind of questions are really, really tough because they are based on 200% factual knowledge. If you know it, you know it, you don't know it, don't know it. 
so in my opinion i personally find them as very tough questions because i do not have any scope now if i don't let's say if i have not heard about the the gandha mardan hill it can be anywhere in india no how would i guess if it is in odisha or bengal or where so absolutely this kind of question you have to be star mark very very careful if no idea please keep it right there don't even waste time you can you can later on come back to do it and do some guess work but if you this is purely 200 based on 200% based on fact no scope of ground work uh, any guess work but of course i will explain the question to you so the question is about the biodiversity heritage sites what is a biodiversity heritage site now this is something you have to first understand in india india has 44 biodiversity heritage sites and that is spread across 16 states in india but what is a biodiversity heritage site this these uh, bhs is basically it's a well defined area with a unique and ecological fragile ecosystem these are the keywords any site which is being considered having unique ecosystem having ecological fragile ecosystem they are going to be termed as biodiversity heritage sites and that particular site must be having at least one of these characteristics that area at least should be having some species richness may have the high endemism having lots of native biodiversity to that area or maybe having some rare or threatened species or maybe having some keystone species or some other kind of species or maybe there was a presence of wild ancestors of domesticated cultivated like any of these categories can be there or maybe that area uh, is having significant cultural ethical aesthetic value for maintaining cultural diversity if any of these condition is there we can count that site as a biodiversity heritage site but that area must be having some unique and ecological fragile ecosystem now thankfully in india under section 37 of the biological diversity act 2002 if the state government has this right the state government may identify the areas of biodiversity importance that is the power given to the state government guys okay and and uh, uh, of course after consultation with the local bodies now this is very important you may be asked this question if uh, uh, you know declaring biodiversity sites if, uh, is it is it an, in the domain of uh, state or the center so please remember this point is very important the state government has the right to identify area as biological heritage site this is important plus once an area is declared as bhs that does not restrict the local communities uh you know continuing their practice in that area it's 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 more symbolical it's not going to put any restrictions on the activities of the local people and that's why while declaring the uh, bhs the state government is always supposed to consult with the local bodies so that their activities does not hamper in any way now if you look at the question now the right answer for that if if you see the right explanation so all the biodiversity sites that are being given to you so we have this so called uh, gandha mardan hill it belongs in odisha then you have the tungong dho that is in the state of sikkim and the remaining two called the char bali danga and namthing pokhari both belong to the state of west bengal but they were not easy to guess at all why they are called biodiversity heritage sites that explanation is there in your pdf you can read from there because it's a factual information i mean why this has become biodiversity so of course it is given that why some areas having some endemic species some some are having uh, you know giving some relation with the local communities so or some cultural uh, uh, heritage sites something so i'm not going to repeat that i'm not you can straight away read but i'm i've just told you how to approach this kind of question okay next question is probably the favorite question of our test series i know now again for the i think for the fifth or sixth time uh, for not fifth or sixth but maybe fourth or fifth time we are discussing the pvtgs and i think by this time every one of you must have become the champions of pvtg right i hope so so particularly vulnerable tribal group what is a pvtg oh we have done it n number of times n number of times right so we know certain facts for sure i want you to revise it one more time with me it's okay bear it with me please because this topic is important so we can't uh, help but to keep asking the question so pvtg pvtg which used to be previously called as primitive tribal group now their new name after 2006 they have been renamed as pvtg 
Now, this is nothing but a sub-classification of the scheduled tribes. In India, we have many scheduled tribes. Out of the many scheduled tribes, there are 75, please note the number, there are 75 tribal groups which are considered to be PVTG out of 705 scheduled tribes that we have in, in, in India. Why? Why this sub-classification was done? Because we, 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 we believe that these 75 PVTGs are comparatively more vulnerable, they are more backward, they are having more primitive traits, they have some kind of geog geog geographical uh, isolation or having low literacy or maybe having some negative to zero population growth or some kind of backwardness and that actually makes them more vulnerable comparatively to the other tribal groups and that is why there was a need to classify them into, se into a separate category. And most of them, like largely all these PVTG, they are still dependent on pre-agriculture level of technology. You can understand. They are still living in that er era where they are, they are absolutely away from technology. They are using pre-agricultural days technologies. It was in 1973 when Debar Commission, remember this commission very importantly. 1973 Debar Commission, they set up a separate category and the name was given as Primitive Tribal, Tribal Group. Then later on, in 2006, the name was changed and became more, uh, 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 you know, particular, calling them as particular vul uh, vulnerable tribal groups. And now, right now, we in India, as of now, there are 75 groups that we have. Out of the 75, it is Odisha having the highest number of PVTGs. How many for Odisha? 13. There are 13 PVTGs that alone belongs to Odisha. After Odisha, we have the highest number in Madhya Pradesh and Andhra Pradesh and that includes the Telangana part because uh, that time it was undivided Andhra Pradesh, right? So, and in Odisha, it is the Saura community having the largest PVTG uh, population, having some 5,35,000 5, people. This is important, guys. In India, please remember, this whole PVTG population is spread across 18 states. But only one, only one UT, not even more. There is only one UT in India having PVTG and that is Andaman Nicobar. We have, we have told you earlier also. Now, why this question becomes relevant? Because last year, the government of India has started Pradhan Mantri Janjati Adivasi Nyay Mahabhyan, popularly called as PM Janman. And because the scheme is very much fresh, and this particular scheme was, was actually announced to uplift the PVTGs. That's why this topic of PVTG become really important for 2024 exam. So remember this new scheme called Pradhan Mantri Janman, specifically to uplift the PVTG. And very interestingly, uh, this scheme is actually central sponsored scheme where the funding is to be shared between center and states with a very special ratio. 64% to be contributed by center and 36 to be contributed by states. The scheme is very much in line with the Pradhan Mantri PVTG development mission which is already there, uh, which was already working to improve the socio-economic conditions of PVTG. Now to supplement that efforts, we have got a new scheme called Pradhan Mantri Janman Yojana. This is absolute important information for your upcoming exam. So that's why this question is very, very relevant. So now you can see here very easily you can now you can you can give the answer. So clearly it is not Andhra having the highest number of PVT, it is Odisha. And it is not 95, yes, 75 PVTGs that we have so far. First and fourth are correct. Only answer is, is supposed to be B. I will I will call it very easy because we have done it so many number of times. And I hope now it has become even more uh, comfortable in your head. Now we have done it with so, so many times. Now very interesting question, next one. And very shocking but interesting and very uh, important question. Which of that, which, which country became the first South Asian country to register, to uh, uh, officially recognize and register the same sex marriages? Of course it is not India. In India still, now, now we have decriminalized homosexuality. Uh, Section 377 of the IPC was scrapped. In India, homosexuality is no more a crime. But we have still not recognized the same-sex marriages as a legal one. And that, and now you can, you can eliminate. See, Thailand though cannot be the answer at all because Thailand is not a country of South Asia, let me tell you. It is Southeast Asia. 
clearly not india you know because if that would have happened you must be the first to know that right now the only option is nepal and bhutan so you can still take little bit of risk little bit of risk can be taken in this question so right answer is supposed to be nepal easy question easy but if it becomes tough you can still have the option you can still have a chance of taking a risk because clearly the two you have uh, eliminated logic wise and in bhutan you do not have uh, that much you know uh, that much progressive uh, policies as compared to nepal nepal is comparatively more progressive in such kind of things so yeah it is very very uh, interesting that nepal has become the first south asian country to officially re recognize and register the same sex marriages answer is nepal do remember that guys that brings us to the next question which is about the codex elementaris commission oh my god this is called cac very important this is also called as food code in short it is also known as the food code what is this let's understand then we'll come back to the question so let's talk about this so called codex elementaris which is also known popularly called called as the food code so basically this uh, cac that we are talking about it's an international food safety and quality standard setting body this is the first thing that you have to remember the cac is all about the food safety like like in india for example we have the fssai right fssai is all about food safety and standard for india but the same at the global level we have got the cac it now it becomes easy for you to relate the fssai and cac it's the international uh, food safety standard uh, quality standard authority which was established 1963 by fao and world health organization why fao because it's about the food safety and ultimately food safety has a direct relation to the health so very logically w who has to be the next partner into that so yeah this is important you remember it please what is this code elementary which is called the food code they are basically globally accepted standards when it comes to uh, the food safety and quality standards for the food they are globally accepted standards and uh, under this code elementaries all food from raw agricultural commodities to the processed food everything is covered so it has a very wide coverage in terms of the commodities majorly the food code deals with the food hygiene all the additives that are being used pesticide residues contaminants labeling pres preserv presentation everything is being included in this code elementaries this food code but let me tell you this is not this is not mandatory it has so many things but still this standard is still voluntary but the government and the food industries worldwide they widely adopt them because they are really good when it comes to the standards of global level so but please remember this is this is a key point remember this what it all covers remember it who has established the food code what is a food code and please mark my words this is most important statement they are still voluntary not mandatory they are not compulsory but still followed at a global level on a voluntary basis okay now you can come back to the question and now you have this uh, uh, option now which statement is correct so yeah the first statement is absolutely not correct why what it what it's written c is the codex elementaries commission is it by fao yes but is wto involved why why wto would be the part it is not the wto at all so now we know it is uh, uh, it is our who which is a part so clearly first statement is wrong second is right answer has to be b okay now this is important now first statement now you can now you can you can think logically but if for, for that at least you should be aware it's a food code otherwise becomes really difficult uh, to to guess it right but if you if you now if look at the second statement it clearly says it's a food code then you can think of that instead of wh uh, wto it has to be wto so anyways in any scenario uh, you can solve this question with little bit of risk involved but you can still has a chance to solve the question and get the answer as b right answer okay Question fifty six is about rupee kisan card. Now, what this question is all about? Let's see. First, let's let's read about the rupee kisan card. Then we'll come back to the question. Okay. Now, very interestingly, uh, rupee kisan card is still a pilot project. What is a pilot project? It like when the government tests the scheme at a small sample 
uh, scale and if that becomes good, uh, response is good, becomes successful, then you go for a flagship or pan India kind of scheme. So Rupay Kisan card, a Kisan credit card is still a pilot project and uh, as the name says everything, right? So under this project, all the cooperative society members, they will have accounts in the concerned district central cooperative banks and Rupay Kisan credit cards are being distributed to the account holders of these central cooperative banks. Number one, first information you have to remember. See, Kisan credit card is not a new scheme. I'm talking about Rupay Kisan. Rupay is a payment gateway. Like instead of Visa or MasterCard, what is a Rupay? Rupay, you know, it's a it's a it's an Indian payment gateway. No, this is an Indian payment gateway. The way same way we have the Visa and MasterCard and Mesto card. So now because obviously government is promoting Indian payment gateways rather being dependent on the other uh, uh, global gateways. So Kisan credit card is not a new scheme. This was introduced way back in 1998. And as the name says Kisan credit card, the purpose was clear to provide to give farmers with timely and adequate credit support because because in terms of agriculture, the farmers really need time to time. The farmers need that credit support. They need money to carry out their agricultural activities. Now, initially that was just restricted to limited number of farmers. But this Kisan credit card was, card was actually extended not just to the farmers, but also to the allied and non-farm activities in 2004. First, it was just restricted for the cropping activities. Then it now after 2004, now Kisan credit card is used to uh, give assistance to the uh, agriculture and all the allied activities. What non-farm activities you can think? Livestock, for example, livestock rearing. You can think of fisheries. You can think of other uh, associated activities, right? Like you can think of uh, the the uh, apiculture, silviculture. You can think of all these activities or sericulture, the silk activities. So now it is being expanded. Now, please remember this very interesting part. Uh, Kisan credit card is actually given to anybody who is between the age of 18 to 65. That is the eligibility age. And this is something you have to remember. The question was about it only. Okay, now interestingly, when you are talking about Kisan credit card, do remember objectives are very clear. As the name says, and especially the uh, Rupay uh, credit card. Uh, in this Rupay Kisan credit card, we are targeting, we are going to give short term credit requirements for to the crops for especially for the cultivation of crops we are also going to give money to the farmers for post harvest expensive uh, also to produce marketing loan consumption requirements of farmer household so you can see the coverage is quite wide under the rupee kisan credit card we are covering lot of aspects of agriculture and the allied activities that is uh, that is there so this these are all the objectives and you never know you may have a question coming only on the objective of such a scheme. So now if you look at this, this question, first and third being correct, only problem is with the years. Now, very logically, if I have to think very logically, please understand in India, the working age actually starts from 18 plus. No? I mean, 16 is very rarely when people in India starts working. Make sense? Is it easy? So obviously cannot be 16 because in India, we consider till 18, we consider, uh, we give the definition as a child. So working population starts in India from 18 to 60. So clearly 16 is not the right answer. So this helped me eliminate the option number two. And if I do that, see clearly just by, by eliminating the wrong options, I'm going to still get my answer as one and three. So that way the question was a medium level, but you can attempt it with elimination with understanding common common things and and doing some smart work you can eliminate because in india hardly there is any person working at the age of 16 right that brings us to the next question which is cms conservation of migratory species of the wild animal very important very very important uh, uh, you know this international framework called cms we'll talk about it then we'll come back on uh, on to the question right so talking about question 57 and the CMS, you need to learn certain basics first. What is this CMS? So as the name says, conservation of the, the keyword is migratory species. For migratory species to conserve them, we have got the CMS. This is actually an, an environmental treaty uh, under the overall uh, uh, guidance of United Nations Environment Program. 
this program is important so you must be aware that even this UNEP actually has so many literally so many uh, uh, conservation species uh, uh, you know conservation mechanisms not just the CMS there are so many and I want there are almost 15 there are 15 big treaties under UNEP and my suggestion is at least give a reading of all those 15 very broad networks uh, uh, different different international treaties which are being covered under UNEP. UNEP is a very tall uh, institute to talk about and do read all the reports which are also being published by UNEP. This is my suggestion to all of you guys. So talking about the, the, this uh, CMS, it is under the overall guidance of, uh, of the UNEP. Now this CMS is also popularly called as Bonn Convention. You may have a question coming as Bonn Convention, so be ready with that alternative name also. Why it is called Bonn Convention? Because you, the CMS was signed in 1979 in a city called Bonn in Germany and that's why the name becomes Bonn Convention. Interestingly, CMS is the only global and UN based intergovernmental conventions which was established exclusively for the conservation management of the migratory species. Now, other than CMS, there is no absolutely no treaty that talk exclusively for the migratory species. And when I when I use the word migratory, it's not just the bird, it covers the terrestrial, aquatic and avian. If everything is covered, quite broad domain of covering the migratory species. It also includes the management of their habitats and all the migration routes. And that makes this uh, Bonn Convention as a very important treaty. And again, very one more special point. There are very less treaties which are, which are having legal uh, bindings, but CMS is actually known for having legal binding agreements. So all the members of the CMS, they must, must follow the, the guidance uh, of the CMS. That is very, very important. And other than that, at certain occasions, it also signs some non-legal binding memorandum of, of understanding depending on nature, but mostly, so it has this provision of making any agreement as a legal binding that gives real power to the CMS. That is important guys. Is India a part? Yes, of course, India is also member of the CMS that is important. But please remember, there are still so many countries which are not part of CMS. India joined CMS 1983. But please just to add to your surprise, China is not a member. Russia and US has not been a member of CMS. Even Canada, Japan, these big countries, they are not its member. So you may have this question about especially coming on the members of the CMS. So be careful. India is a member, but all these big powers are not the member of CMS. So this information can be important if any time this question comes in your exam. Okay, now if you go back to the question, here you see both statements are absolutely correct. UNAP, uh, it, it is under UNAP and this is only global treaty for the conservation of migratory species. So your answer has to be C. Both are absolutely correct. Easy, straight away can be attempted, right? That brings us to the question number 58. Question 58 talks about the uh, indigenous people and local communities. Very interesting concept. So what exactly is the meaning of indigenous people and local communities, the IPLCs? Let's talk about that and then we'll come back to the question. Uh, and, and I have a very easy way of eliminating one option. I'll tell you how. So right now, uh, if you go by the definition, so what exactly is this IPLC? Indigenous people, local communities actually refer, as the name says, it refers to the, that distinct group of people having deep historical connections to specific area, territory, regions where they live for generations and generations. If that is the case with certain group of people, we call them indigenous people, the real native people of that area, the local communities, because they have deep historical connections from that area where generations and generations have lived there. And they and, and they, these groups, of course, because they have such a long connection with that place. Of course, these people, these communities, they have distinct cultural, social, economical, political systems which is very much linked to the ancestral land of that particular area. And that is why these communities are so important. 
Conserving them is so important because they have the kind of traditional knowledge that they possess absolutely nowhere in any of the books. Right? So the traditional knowledge and, and they are the key. Actually, these uh, communities are actually the key to get the to share the benefits of the biodiversity from those areas. Because what they know about the place, nobody else knows. They are the best conservationist. They are the best people. They can tell you how to maximize the benefit of the uh, biodiversity of that area. Right? This is very interesting. And these people, they deeply understand the local ecosystems. And they have this wide traditional knowledge that we are talking about. And uh, use, utilizing that, we can actually go for sustainable resource management of that area. But there is one problem. One problem that currently happening to these IPLCs people. The biggest challenge is the historical marginalization and the distrust that these people have with the government. That includes the forest dwellers, indigenous people. Why? Why there is distrust? Because government, they think that government has marginalized them, ignored them. Government has not done enough according to them or for them and there is a there is a clear uh, reason behind that because so far majority of the governments local or state level or national level governments also because governments usually follow a top down approach top down approach for their conservation where 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 the government dictates okay you are supposed to do this you don't do this Top down is when you are passing an order and you want the lower hierarchy to follow that. But that is not the correct way to conserve these people. Rather than top down, the real, the real thing has to be bottom up approach. The government must be going for bottom up approach. You know, taking these people into confidence first. From grassroots level, if you, if you start some movement, of course, that is going to be a game changer for these people. Not the top down. But bottom up approach is what, 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 what it can actually, uh, you know, fill this kind of distress that is there among the people. So what we really need is a bottom up approach. So here all the three statements, here all the three statements are correct. The answer is supposed to be D. Uh, I think this question was an easy one because this is not a hardcore fact based question. By your general understanding of indigenous people, local communities, you can solve this question with very much ease, without any trouble or problem. Okay, that brings us to the question number 59, specifically talking about the Indian bison, which is also called as gore, sometimes called as mithun also. So first we'll, we'll talk about that, then we'll come back. So what is, uh, like you can see in your picture, what is this Indian bison or gore? As you can see from the picture, this is what we call as Indian gore or Indian bison. It is the largest among the wild cattle and the bovids, bovids are those mammals having the cloven foot. You must have seen uh, this kind of feet of these, uh, of these uh, the, the cow, the buffaloes. So they are called bovine animals. So uh, this Indian bison is the largest among that wild cattle and uh, largest among all the bovids that we have. If you domesticate that Indian bison, then it is more popularly known as Mithun or the Gayal. Same thing, but when, when it is, when it is uh, into the wild, it is called more as bison or gore. If you domesticate them, you make them pet, they are more commonly called as Mithun and the Gyals. Where you find this great, giant, large cattle, this Indian bison is actually native to South, Southeast and even in East Asia. So if, if the question says that they are restricted only in India, don't go by the name. The name is Indian bison, but don't think they are restrictive to India. They are spread across South, Southeast and East Asia. In India specifically, they are found uh, in the Himalayan foothills. They also are found in Northeast India. And in Northeast India, they are more commonly called as Mithun uh, that I have, I have experienced so far. They are also found in Eastern Ghats and the western ghats so in india also they are very well distributed guys in fact in some of the uh, national parks like vayanad nagarhol madhumalai bandipur in these national parks they are the center of attraction for those national parks they are so much popular in those areas now remember 
in india there is only one uh, wildlife sanctuary that is called trishna wildlife sanctuary in tripura that is india's only natural breeding center for the bison and this makes this information very very important so that's why a star mark on this information okay in journal where you have seen the all the distribution of the uh, gore so you should be aware that uh, they are mostly or uh, they are mostly occupying the evergreen semi evergreen moist deciduous dry deciduous so they are very adaptable kind of uh, animals no because they have this adaptability to adapt to to variety of uh, biomes so that's why they are very very adaptable and that's why they 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 are spread across so much and uh, they are uh, they are still uh, though they are they are uh, you know losing ground these days they are facing threats like habitat loss uh, hunting is another problem for them but still thankfully so far they are still in the vulnerable category of course we have put them in schedule 1 of our wildlife protection act uh, they need more and more conservation so now if you look at the question you will find all the three statements as absolutely correct but how to solve it difficult question i mean there is absolutely no way to guess the distribution of the animal so in my opinion though the third all three are correct but in my opinion the question was tough because very less scope of guesswork in this if you have got this question be careful very hardly all three are going to be correct in my opinion 95% questions of this nature they have some some issue there is something which is wrong that my gut feeling says so i would have skipped this kind of question if i am not having the knowledge because more chances of getting the things wrong last question is with respect to the e waste management of india it's a very important question guys e waste management is something which is always in the news it's a very contemporary topic very very relevant for india why let's try to understand so when you talk about the e e waste what is the meaning of e waste or electronic waste the full form is electronic waste so the word e waste refers to any electronic product which now are unwanted for you or they're not working or they are at the last of their useful life and you are about to discard them my phone is not working let's throw it out my uh, pc is not working cpu not working let's give it to some raddi wala kabadi wala and that's how we are creating the e waste electronic products when they are no more working no more wanted and we discard them that makes them as electronic waste as per government of india data there is over more than 5 lakh lakh tons of e waste that is being collected and processed in india in 2021 22 so look at the look at the span look at the nature of the kind of e waste india and this is the official figure you know there are there is much more to that if the official figure says 5 lakh ton you can imagine the real nature of that industry in fact in 2020 there was a report which said india has the third largest electronic waste in the world india is the third largest electronic waste producer after after china and usa where india is, is somewhere generating is is going to uh, is somewhere generating 2 million tons 2 million tons of e waste annually imagine this is this is and this too is the data of 2020 you can imagine now what probably it has become because right now we are if we are in 2024 and this is continuously increasing india's e waste is continuously increasing by say 31% so right now there is a huge problem maybe it's not visible today there are other issues that we are focusing upon but but mark my word in the next 5 years or so electronic waste is going to become the next big problem for our country and that is why the government is trying to uh you know make some rules and amendments in the e rule managements and still there is one more big problem it's not just that india is producing so much the real problem is how we are dealing with the e waste right now 95% of india's e waste is still recycled informally by unorganized workers and that too in the unscientific way you understand there is still not any formal industry in india that is taking care uh, of the e waste you must have seen 
in in your local areas there are so many people so many scrap walas they come and they they can purchase any of the electronic waste that you have right 95% e e waste is recycled by those uh, unorganized worker in formal sector and that and they do it purely on unscientific ways and that's why e waste becomes a real source of pollution i mean there are so many uh, uh, so many components in our electronic devices uh, which are actually toxic there are so many toxic toxins which are being released when you dismantle the electronic things right and uh, that's why that, that is a real problem not not that what we are creating but the problem is how we are uh, how we are dealing with that so uh, if you look at the question yes you will have all the four as the right answer and this is exactly what we have discussed right now so answer is supposed to be d even without going in, into the deep facts okay maybe you are not very sure if this is the right figure or not or this is but i think with a general understanding of the e waste management in india this question can be solved easily because we we read lot of things about e waste and at least we have this general idea about the problem of the e waste that we have in in, a, in our country okay and uh, this is a very important topic even for the mains you should prepare this kind of topic guys so that is all from my side so we have discussed the next 20 questions and i really hope you have enjoyed do tell me in the comment section box which particular question was very interesting as per you and uh, tell me uh, how you are doing in your preparation if you have any doubts for the upsc preparation you can always reach out to us just put your query in the comment section box and we are uh, we are more than willing to help you in your queries so that is all from my side see you guys in part number 4 very very soon Thank you so much. Lots of love. God bless you, and best wishes for UPSC 2024. Join, guys.